COVID-19 whole genome sequencing in Karnataka. We also have our in-house expert, Sandhya Ramesh, uh, who has been closely tracking the epidemic um, and all the related scientific developments. So I, before we begin, I would like to ask our viewers to please send in your questions and I will try to take up as many as possible through the course of this episode. Um, but before we take... Oh, all right. So uh, let me just introduce uh, all our panelists once again, because we, I think there was a small technical glitch. So there is uh, with us uh, Dr. Vishal Rao, Associate Dean of Center for Academic Research at Healthcare Global Cancer Center in Bangalore. Dr. Rao is also a member of the Committee for COVID-19 Whole Genome Sequencing in Karnataka. And uh, along with him, we have Dr. Rajiv Das Gupta, a professor at Center of Social Medicine and Community Health at the Jawaharlal Nehru University and member of the National COVID Task Force. We also have our in-house expert, Sandhya Ramesh, who has been tracking the scientific developments around COVID for almost two years now. So, um, you know, before we go in, uh, you know, with my questions, before we begin, I would like our viewers to please send in all your questions. I will take as many as possible over the course of this episode. Um, so my first question is to you, Dr. Das Gupta. Yesterday, we saw ICMR make some uh, significant changes to the COVID testing guidelines. And uh, it seems that from the mantra of test, 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 uh, we have gone back in time. It, now the advice essentially seems to be, uh, you know, to test symptomatic and high risk contacts only. So how do you think this will affect our COVID response? Thank you. Uh, essentially, what the ICMR has done is to come out with a more pragmatic strategy, what it calls the purposive testing strategy. Uh, and I believe uh, it's based on the following premises. First, that the virus and the disease both are no longer novel the way it was one and a half years ago. And therefore, it's not really relevant now, particularly in the face of an astronomical number of cases given the short span uh, to be able to, to track each and everyone meticulously as we were doing. Uh, also that the Omicron variant is highly transmissible and, and the experience from other countries is that tracking and monitoring is, of, of new cases is extremely difficult, particularly for countries like us, uh, where the average number of contacts is much higher than in many societies. And therefore the pragmatic strategy is that need to be adopted and what that's what the uh, the shift uh, towards is of actually tracking hospitalization trends and therefore more nimble footed strategies based on hospitalization uh, data and and what's uh, what's emerging from there so and finally at this point are we one, sorry one, yeah. one more point which i which i think is relevant in this case is that uh, administrative responses particularly in the disaster management framework uh, and what's what certainly now a disaster management mindset uh, is that the non-pharmaceutical interventions such as lockdowns and other physical restrictions are increasingly losing their relevance uh, in this rapid and inexorable community spread and therefore these are the broad reasons why the count of new cases is is losing relevance as far as bringing in rapid shifts in strategy and containment is concerned yeah, so sorry. essentially you are like, are we assuming, are we at this point where we are assuming that everyone is likely to get infected? So should we prioritize just those who are at high risk? That and symptomatic. So essentially what it does is to, to do away with, uh, with uh, testing asymptomatics unless there are specific reasons uh, to, to believe that this particular person is in a high risk group category. And it also um, advises on doing away with unnecessary tests such as merely for hospital administration, uh, hospital uh, admission, sorry, or interstate travel. Uh, those actually do not make much sense uh, for, a, for, a, for a variant uh, that, that spreads so much under the radar. 
Right. Uh, coming to you, Dr. Rao, the uh, guidelines also had a line about, uh, you know, the genome uh, sequencing strategy, where it does say that uh, we don't need to, you know, send all, all uh, positives for genome sequencing. So you have been part of this uh, genome sequencing uh, committee. And my question to is, why is India not sequencing more? Why is that why is it that we only sequence aggressively in reaction to a variant being identified somewhere else? So, uh, Anusha, thank you for uh, for uh, inviting me to the program. Uh, InsaCog was primarily set up by the government of India to accelerate genomic surveillance. And uh, today, uh, Karnataka was one of the early states to have set up a state genomic surveillance unit also to kind of correlate and uh, collaborate and fast track genomic surveillance. And that was to assist the INSACOG in terms of providing this assistance. The aim from one of the best benchmarks of the world, that is the NWAP team in UK was to look at 5% of genomic surveillancing so that you track the new variants. And our learning, if you look at December 2019, 2019, the D614G, December 2020 Delta and December 21 Omicron, there's been a wave of a change for the way we've approached genomics itself. And I'm happy to say that in Karnataka, we saw a turnaround time of as less as three days for reporting. Now that was actually able to do with a high number of uh, uh, cases being reported also for genomic surveillance. The importance that people need to know here is this is called genomic surveillance and not genomic testing. Because a lot of people started asking for, I want to know whether it's Omicron or whether it is Delta. It does not matter. Because the current trends are for surveillance, for assessing and planning public health response and not for treatment. There is no difference in treatment for people. And at this juncture, I would just like to add one point that the latest data that has come out on Omicron seems to have two aspects to it. One is you can pick it up with the S gene target failure, which is added as a part of PCR. And today there are enough of kits available that can actually help you pick up this without going in for genomics. And this is only FYI, but it is not going to change your treatment. The second, what we've got data from South Africa and globally is that today Omicron has two important aspects to it. One is the mild severity, which we attribute to the biological behavior that Omicron spreads more in the throat and bronchus than in the lungs in terms of multiplication. And second is the vaccination rate that we have achieved, which is much better than that of South Africa. So what we are going to face in terms of absolute rise of positivity is not going to be creating a panic. And Dr. Dasgupta very, uh, very, I think, elaborately uh, uh, emphasized on this to say that ICMR has matured in its approach to accepting the fact that we will have to live with this virus in the coming years and not talk about elimination. We have talked about coexistence now, and that's the approach it has adopted to. Thank you. Right. Uh, my question to Sandhya next is that uh, now that there is this, uh, you know, shift in strategy where unlike the previous waves, the more important now is given to the home COVID tests and or rapid antigen tests. So uh, what is it that has changed in our understanding of the science of rapid antigen tests? And uh, how, again, how do you think this is going to impact uh, our, uh, the spread of disease in, in our country? Well, so what we understand now about with rapid antigen tests and Omicron is that when it comes to this particular variant, it multiplies rather quickly. So when someone gets infected, their viral load goes up pretty quickly. So um, it is thought that for specifically the Omicron variant rapid tests are slightly more reliable than they used to because your viral loads do tend to multiply quickly. So it's likely that if you are infected, you could test negative in the morning. And then in the evening, if you take a test again, you could test positive when your viral loads reach a certain threshold. So because of this, I think if done correctly and efficiently, home tests can actually curb transmission to a certain degree when people follow isolation guidelines and if, if they suspect exposure can then immediately get a self-test. So it reduces our reliance on RT-PCR and also brings us results pretty quickly. 
you know, uh, one day, two days versus just 15 minutes. That's a big advantage. So it's definitely um, at this moment in the third wave, it's definitely a very handy tool to have for most people. And I think um, good use of home testing is actually quite important so as to not overburden our health systems as well. Um, with respect to ICMR, uh, you know, changing their guidelines, one of the concerns is that the healthcare system, the testing system could be overburdened when people keep going for repeated PCR tests. And one of the ways we can combat that is by doing home tests at home ourselves. And hey. this is the benefit um, at this moment. Right. Uh, Dr. Rao, my question is, you know, in when we talk about home tests, uh, there is a lot uh, of, you know, a, a gap in how educated some parts of our country is versus, you know, some rural areas where do we really have that kind of a reach? Um, you know, how how is how are these change of guidelines going to affect those who are not from very educated households? So and, you know, like, so far, we knew that if there's an RT-PCR test which says it is positive, the person is more likely to take precautions to stay at home, uh, as opposed to, you know, a home test that they do, do themselves and there's no um, per se, like, uh, you know, a, a, a definitive uh, diagnosis. So in that case, you know, do you, how do you think this will play out in a country like India? So uh, this has one good part to it and one troublesome part to it. Uh... The, the, the good part to it is that it eases the burden from the system of you running to diagnostics and being heavily dependent on diagnostic centers. It's simplified that you can do this test at home. So the anxiety of waiting for 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours to some few days is reduced drastically. And like Sandhya very rightly pointed out, viral loads are high. So the, the accuracy and sensitivity is much better. So these are the good parts to doing home tests. The bad parts, I think you've already elaborated the first aspect of it, but there are a couple of other ones. Currently, reporting is going to get heavily underreported because a lot of people who get positive on these rapid antigen or self-tests are not going to report. So these are going to be self-isolated. So that brings us to two scenarios. If you're self-isolated, well and good. But if you're going to roam around, that's the danger. Right. So now until they reach the healthcare system, these people are not going to get detected by the system. Only if they get hospitalized, they, that is when the, the system will flag it. So till that time, I think these are the people who are going to move around and spread. And I think that's where a large philosophical shift in ICMR's approach has also happened to say that, look, lockdown is a way to prepare. Lockdown is a way to kind of uh, slow the transmission until you buy time for preparing increased vaccination. But there is only one single answer that is third dose of vaccination and nothing more. So right. at this juncture, I think we will have underreporting grossly, but we will have to also ease up the thing and learn and talk about living with this virus and moving forward rather than creating a panic wave about it, but not to let our guards down and follow transmission appropriate behavior for the coming months. This is not to proclaim a premature victory. Right. So in a way, we are actually shifting some of the onus on the um, on the public in general that they also have to. Uh, by now, everyone knows the basics of uh, COVID prevention protocols, and uh, there is a lot of uh, expectation from the public to also um, sort of cooperate. So I have a lot of uh, questions coming in. So uh, let me take a few of those. Um, Anand Kumar is asking: Should pregnant women who are vaccinated be worried more, even if they're COVID? symptoms are mild. So, uh, Dr. Das Gupta, would you like to take this? No, um, uh, pregnant women shouldn't be worried uh, if they're vaccinated. But what's uh, happened in the country is actually the other way around, uh, that pregnant and lactating mothers and, and women who are planning a pregnancy have actually not taken the vaccine. And, and if you go to the uh, COVID uh, website and the dashboard, you will see a very big uh, shortfall of about 3 million women uh, vaccinated less than men. Now, this is not the conventional uh, you know, gender divide that we understand, but this is, this is built around a biological construct, uh, whether it will harm the child who is uh, feeding, uh, being fed on breast milk or the unborn child, 
And it's also got to do with the shift in the vaccine policy, which was initially not recommended for pregnant and lactating women and then uh, recommended. So that's, that's a communications aspect we are working on very, very strongly and very fast. But if a, if a uh, lady, a woman who is, uh, who is vaccinated and subsequently gets pregnant, there is no additional risk. So uh, what would your advice be right now for those women who have not? So, so what, what, what uh, the, the, the government and the program is advising is certainly for, for women who are currently pregnant or lactating or even planning a pregnancy to certainly take the vaccine. Uh, and if a first dose has been taken to complete the schedule. Right. All right. So uh, the next question is from uh, Kumar Satyam. If uh, someone had been infected with COVID in the past, after how many days or months should he or she take the vaccine or uh, the booster if he or she has been infected after taking double doses of the vaccine? The answer is three months. Three months. I think three this is something that months. that was clarified in the uh, in the first wave as well. Um all right, so the next question is from Shomadik Bhomik. Uh, are asymptomatic people not spreading COVID? What is the evidence base behind not testing? You want me to answer? Yeah, please. I think we've okay. lost uh, <laughs> Dr. Rao oh, for now. Oh, we'll oh, try sorry. to connect back okay. with him. Okay. Now, um, this, th th this is an important question, and this is a worry in, in, in the minds of many. Now, uh, the, the understanding is as follows, that the incubation period is about three days. Transmission occurs one or two days before the onset of symptoms and during the two to three days afterward. And after seven days, there's virtually no risk of transmission. One in three will certainly remain asymptomatic. And that's really the concern uh, that, the, that, the, uh, uh, that the viewer has uh, is, is very legitimate. Uh, that Omicron certainly spreads very rapidly uh, through asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic persons. And uh, therefore, therefore, uh, what Dr. Rao was saying is extremely relevant, that uh, home testing or, or even asymptomatics uh, not testing, uh, while a pragmatic decision will all, can also lead to relatively uh, lower counts. And therefore, uh, to, to, to extend the, the argument uh, that Dr. Rao was making, uh, the advisory, while it's pragmatic, while it's rational, rational certainly needs to be backed by appropriate uh, risk communication messages. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, it can get misconstrued. Right. Um, we have another viewer question. Sandhya, I think uh, you can take this. Couple Call is asking, what is the efficacy of the booster dose and how long does it take for the antibodies to set in? Well, um, so how booster doses work is that they're similar to how vaccines work. And each time you take a booster dose, your immune response becomes much more tailored, much more precise. And your B cell and T cell responses, your cellular immunity and your humoral uh, immunity also improves. And by that, I mean both the quantity of B cells as well as subsequently the quantity of um, antibodies that are produced. All of these climb up with each booster shot that you take. So when you take booster shots as, uh, you know, by the, uh, according to the specified gap, with every subsequent booster dose that you take, your body becomes more efficient at fighting the virus and is able to produce a higher level of neutralizing antibodies. Uh, so also like how long does it take after the uh, booster dose to for, for you know? Um... Well, so typically immediately, which is why people start developing immune response symptoms like fever and uh, body pain, because that's that's your body responding to the vaccine. And so your responses after the vaccine do occur immediately. And when you contract the virus in a natural setting after that, you expect the same response to follow. Your body kicks into action pretty much immediately, which is why many experts actually suspect that now since the majority of at least the urban population is doubly vaccinated and also has protection, a lot of people have protection from previous infections, it is thought that the first early symptoms that are presented after infection 
could actually be immune response symptoms as opposed to symptoms of COVID. So there are some experts who do think that your um, you start the incubation period actually might start a day or two after um, you know symptoms manifest, which is when you reach the um, when you start developing COVID symptoms basically, and as a result you might be infectious for slightly longer as opposed to say Delta when after exposure you start developing symptoms three days later and then you immediately test positive it could not be the uh, same for Omicron. It is, um, it is a thought uh, from some experts, but uh, according to the guidelines, we're still following up these guidelines of isolating for seven days. Um, there are chances that, uh, you know, we've seen there have been lots of reports about people who've tested positive on the rapid test continuously for nine days to 10 days. So that is something that people who are home isolating and, you know, are willing to take tests at the end of their isolation period should also probably do. Right. Uh, Dr. Vishal, uh, since we have you back, I had a, a question about, you know, you, you are an oncologist yourself. And uh, I just wanted to understand from you the, um, you know, uh, the, the experience of uh, can cancer patients during this pandemic and what what has it been their uh, routine, uh, you know, treatments have been constantly interrupted. So they're also in, uh, immunocompromised. So um, what would your advice be for them? Uh, what does Omicron, what does this third wave mean for them? You know, um, broadly, I would first touch upon the larger issue that Omic uh, COVID overall, COVID-19 was one important communicable disease that hit us in 2020 that specifically targeted the non-communicable diseases. And strangely enough, it was this non-communicable diseases group that got neglected the most. You know, for some reason globally, while communicable diseases were the talk, what people couldn't recognize more clearly was they were specifically targeting the non-communicable diseases group of diabetics, hypertensive, cardiac, kidney disease, cancer, various. And cancer is one among the spectrum of these chronic diseases. Now, all of them got neglected in various proportions and aspects based on their share numbers, but all did get neglected, unfortunately. What I'm today seeing is a lot of backlog of cases that were pending for the last one, one and a half years who feared coming to the hospital. Some of them, along with their cancer, I saw with sugars of 300, with HbA1c of 11, 13, obviously showing that they've neglected it. A lot of people with comorbidities. So the biggest damage I think that we've had globally is neglecting non-communicable diseases overall. Now coming to the specifics of cancer, Cancers, you know, during the uh, during the wave one, we had a lot of concerns in terms of preparations at our center and HCG wondering how are we going to deal with cancer because cancer by itself was at a top priority in all of the listings in guidelines saying that we should not neglect these people. So we had to create an ecosystem where we protect them, keep their immune system up and treat them effectively. And that was a daunting task that we had to achieve in across all cancer centers of the country. Now, the learnings from the first and the second wave for us was that there was a, not a drastic impact on the immune system. In fact, outcomes were not drastically different in the initial assessments of it. So people did withstand it very nicely. People did come out of it and the mortality between the two groups was not significantly different. So this was very encouraging for us. But like I emphasized earlier, the overall differences in the gap would be because of the delay that many people came with larger, more advanced stages, which was unfortunate. Mm -hmm. A person who could have been picked up in stage one is coming at stage four, which increases the overall divide in terms of complexity of the treatment and the cost to treat. Right. So uh, what would your advice be to, you know, a patient right now? Um, because also like OPDs across, like especially in Delhi, uh, you know, again, once again, we are seeing that OPDs are uh, closing and we again are uh, sort of delaying routine surgeries. So what should a patient do? So again, my humble submission to all the viewers and reiterating the fact that do not neglect your non-communicable diseases. Yes, there is a need to be cautious. 
there is beautiful platforms of teleconsultations available please do not neglect your condition there are home cares available even at the peripheries i think it should not be that because we are even today with telemedicine able to reach the most peripheral corners of the country we ourselves did a small studies wherein we did follow up and proactively called our patients and inform them that look you need to keep your check if you have a symptom go to this particular physician close by we connected them with the nearest doctors in the peripheral regions but i think we need to evolve systems wherein there is a cross talk between these two ecosystems of patients and the healthcare fraternity so that we we narrow the gap of inequalities that are going to happen because of this fear or this wrong approach to delaying treatments right so uh, you know um, that that is actually quite helpful I, i mean i personally have heard a lot of people just not going to the doctor because they're scared to uh, you know expose themselves uh, so another question from dhruv patel uh, can we do mix and match for booster dose compared to original vaccine dose so again i think at this point uh, our our india's guidelines don't allow for uh, ma- uh, vaccines to be mixed and this is something that is still under consideration am i right uh, uh, dr so, dash oh yeah so you might you, you can no no i think let dr das gupta go ahead and talk yeah. okay very briefly uh, the mix and match or cocktail or more formally the heterologous uh, combination uh, that as you said very rightly is under consideration uh, india certainly has the advantage of the availability of a very large Uh, i mean a fair fair choice of vaccines uh, now how this will play out uh, we'll have to wait and watch uh, some of the evidence is that mix and match vaccines do uh, offer a better booster uh, res- boost response uh, however currently uh, as as it started yesterday uh, it, it would be if you if you schedule a, a vaccine or a booster dose or even if you walk in uh, you will have to go to the center which is offering the same vaccine that you received earlier uh, and and if you if you book through the covin app it will automatically show you only the centers uh, where the vaccine is available as per your uh, your your previous schedule right uh, i think uh, we are uh, you know running out of time but i just want to uh, ask one more question here um, so from vineet ambath he is saying that international travelers have to undergo seven day quarantine but uh, get tested post this period even if they have not been infected but people who are discharged as per home isolation guidelines need not get retested so can this uh, impact the accuracy of case count and spread of covid we already talked about how uh, you know case count right now is not as much as relevant as it was but uh, wh- there does seem to be like you know a, a different set of rules for uh, you know international travelers and those who are uh, testing positive here in india um Dr. Das, you asking me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well. Currently, uh, currently, the bar is set a little higher for the international travelers uh, because of the risk of importation of of uh, infections. Uh, also, it is not just about Omicron, but multiple variants will continue to emerge across countries. Where uh, new variants will emerge or may emerge from India as well, and and be exported to other countries. so as far as international travelers go uh, the bar is generally set a little higher and uh, as dr rao was earlier explaining in terms of genomic surveillance also a far higher proportion of samples are are actually tested from international passengers who who develop symptoms right uh, to that i have a counter question for dr uh, rao actually it, you know uh, again like i i said right in the beginning we do have a strategy where we sequence more of what is coming from outside but india has a huge population which means we do have a, a very high risk of new variants developing from here and do we really have the um, the kind of infrastructure to actually um, you know identify these in time like south africa did it was able to you know ahead of time warn everyone about omicron but we if we if we don't uh, te- sequence enough within our country then uh, don't we risk uh, missing out on variants so just a quick note on this unlike 
doing a PCR or doing a complete blood count where you put the sample into the machine and a report comes out. Genomic sequencing is a fair complex procedure by itself. So which includes from the point of sample collection to the point of sample processing and quality check to all the wells in the particular machine being filled, whether it's a MySec, HiSec or a Nanopore, there are various machines and then they have to do the full run. And after that begins the real tough work of bioinformatics of analyzing millions of proteins. Each of these takes usually a couple of days to a couple of weeks based on the bandwidth you have of technicians, laboratory experts, sample collections, quality checks, technicians at the machine place where it is installed to the bioinformatics teams. It's fairly complex. Like the way when in the beginning of the pandemic, we did not know what a PCR was and today even small districts have PCR. States have, uh, have uh, risen up to the occasion to set up genomic surveillance and understood that this is something that we have to invest for the future. And already India is at a point in time where I think there are best of the best systems that are working with InsaCog to, to I think, aggregate and kind of bring together the best talent source of the country to show that we, we call ourselves, for example, like the Silicon Valley, we call ourselves we have the capabilities to actually deliver something that any part of the West can do and we are ready to do so today. It's a great opportunity that we have to take it today. Karnataka is taking it to six districts. Genomic surveillance is being taken to six districts in the country, in the, in the state. It's a great proud moment for me to say, I never thought that we will be talking about genomic surveillance in districts. So yes, we are ready. We are ramping up the numbers and we are in par with any system and I recently interacted some time back with some experts from the USA CDC or the UK NWAP and they were pretty amazed to see that these are the systems that we have evolved which is par with any international system. There's a little bit of improvements that we could do to expand our scope to the next level in terms of genomic mining, data sharing and other things. But I think at any point in time if you look head to head we are I think with the best of the world. All right, that is that is actually good to hear. And it is true that we are, uh, you know, considering where we were just two years back in terms of genome sequencing, we have come a far way. Um, Sandhya, last question. Uh, there is, you know, a, a lot of reports about Delta Cron. Where it's being, uh, you know, mistakenly called a new variant. So can you just, you know, give us a sense of uh, what it is, why this, um, this name came up, and is it something to be uh, afraid of? Well, all the data indicates right now that it's not a thing. It's not really something that we need to be worried about for multiple reasons. One is that if we just look at the sequences that have been uploaded on GSAID, which is one of the three um, databases that WHO uses. Uh, so we can see that um, when we look at uh, sequences from even including the couple of sequences that were found in France and Israel, there are just about 21 sequences of this B1642, um, which is called Delta Cron. And it actually made its first appearance much before Omicron all the way back in November. And there has not been an increase in the number of sequences so far. It's just a total of 21. And compared to that, Omicron, we detected the first sequence about three weeks after we got the first Delta Cron sequence. And Omicron now has almost or over 150,000 sequences, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it doesn't really seem to be spreading either that. Um, and also Omicron is just basically taking over everywhere. That's one thing. And the other thing is virologists have pointed out internationally that when these sequences are analyzed, they don't really cluster together. They don't appear to have branched off from a single ancestor, so to speak. Um, and it looks like when the sequences are examined in detail, it looks like a case of contamination in labs. That's not, that's not a comment on the quality of labs. Contamination does occur in a lot of labs for various reasons. Um, so looking at the data, virologists at this moment seem to think that it is merely just contamination and nothing really that we have to worry about. And uh, just, I would say at this moment, Deltatron is not a thing. 
Right. All right. Thank you, Sandhya, so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rao and Dr. Das Gupta for joining us today. And I hope uh, a lot of your questions have been answered. And we did learn a lot from this session about how uh, pregnant women should be, uh, you know, um, getting vaccinated, about how immunocompromised patients need to take more care of themselves. And uh, in general, about why the testing guidelines uh, have uh, shifted, have changed from what uh, was being followed so far. Uh, I do hope this was an informative uh, session for everyone. And uh, for those of you uh, who have been watching us, do, do make sure you can, uh, you know, you join in tomorrow again. Once again, we'll come with another episode of uh, Virus Decode, where we will have an another set of experts to answer all of your questions. Thank you so much. This is Mohana Basu for The Print. Thank you. Thank you, Mona.